Welcome back. We are Gentlemen United and you are in the man cave. In the show tonight and in honor of our veterans on this U.S. Memorial Day, I'll be talking to veteran, retired Air Force Major, Black professional, and my big brother from another mother, Daryl Winfield. Daryl served in the Middle East in Desert Storm in the early 1990s and will be sharing his thoughts and memories with us. He is also the father of a Gentlemen United member and entrepreneur, Brandon Winfield. As always, for those watching this live broadcast on YouTube, feel free to add your comments and questions in the comment bar. I will watch for them throughout the show and will incorporate them into the show, time permitting. Joining us tonight is USAF Major Daryl Winfield, and of course, you, our viewers. I'm Sean Best, and I'm your host and moderator. Now, before we get into the interview with Daryl, who you see on the screen here, um, I'm just going to give you a couple of brief uh, points about Operation Desert Storm for those of you who don't remember it or those of you who weren't around for it. Um, <clears throat> Operation Desert Storm, of course, was an operation that was launched by the United States Air Force when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, I believe it was. Uh, the air offensive began in January of 1991, and essentially it was the first high-tech air warfare and first air combat since Vietnam. So it was the beginning of the next level of high-tech air warfare and set up the stage for air superiority leading into the 21st century. So to give you an idea of the type of arsenal that the United States was working with against the Iraqi uh, Air Force, uh, the U.S. had uh, F-15 Strike Eagles, F-15C Eagles, uh, which with a uh, much greater degree of agility and superior weapons, that AWACS high-altitude radar um, uh, tracking um, equipment, that the EF-11 Air Ravens, which were fast and stable and they were used for radar jamming. They had the Apache helicopters, which you might have seen in some of the, uh, uh, of the movies, uh, which uh, completed night strikes on critical Iraqi ground assets, radar, airfield, etc., and of course, air tankers. We're going to talk a bit about air tankers uh, today. Some of the advantages that the United States Air Force had was superior training. They had superior technology, which allowed them to engage in what they called beyond visual range attack, or BVR. Basically, hitting a target that was outside of visual range, which is the first time in, uh, in, in air warfare history that that technology existed and also a coordinated offensive tactics called the OODA loop, also known as observation, orientation, decision, and action. Very, very coordinated offensive um, tactics that uh, gave them air superiority over the Iraqis. Uh, the Iraqi arsenal included French and Soviet fighters, which included the Mirage F-1, the MiG-25 Foxbat, which could uh, hit speeds of Mach 2.83, and the MiG-29. Uh, the advantage that the Iraqis had were that they were battle-hardened pilots because they had been fighting a, a war with Iran, and their fighters were skilled and aggressive. So that gives you a bit of a sense of what the difference is and, and sort of the leap of, of complexity and technology that occurred between Vietnam and 1991 Desert Storm. Um, I'll include a lot of those video clips in the I-bar at the top um, as we go through the show, so feel free to take a look and really get an understanding of what was in what. Uh, uh, was involved in, in, in that operation. But now let's get back to Daryl. So, Daryl, how's it going, man? Great, man. Thank you for having hey, me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, okay, Daryl, so tell us a little bit about you. Where were you born? When did you decide that you wanted to serve? Uh, where I was born was in Virginia, a little town called Petersburg. I was actually born there and raised <laughs> probably no more than 10 minutes from the hospital I was born in. Uh, in 64 I'm an old guy and uh, back then Petersburg was a great typical in the south little factory town you know um, uh, nice family neighborhoods almost everybody in the town except those that were teachers and maybe doctors and other types of professionals all sort of worked in that same factory one or two factories um, so it really really gave the whole town a very close-knit feel um, so not only a lot of times that were your neighbors obviously quite familiar with you, but you know almost everybody in the town knew who you were, knew knew your mother, and if you you know you were play messing up any sort of sports or anything like that, you know everybody knew who you were. Right, right. And of course, if you're messing up, they can say, uh, yeah. "Miss Winfield, I saw Daryl messing up." <laughs> yeah, or I saw Daryl crash his bike, or. Yeah. Or, or something, you know. Yeah, my mother had rats that would rat me out too, so I know that's like. Um, okay, so I understand that you studied at the Virginia Military Institute. Now, tell me a bit about VMI, its history, and what your experience was like there. 
Um, well, a, a little bit of a, of a backtrack because you don't end up in a place like VMI by happenstance. It was it was part of a plan, and that plan was that I was going to go into the military and I wanted to fly airplanes, and I pretty much landed on that um, cold, locked in, and unwavering when I was about 15 years old. Um, and, and of course, there was a lot of doubters. I mean, that was a big leap um, from, you know, from my family and and from a lot of the people around me. You know, most people, most of those guys, except, you know, were, were, were headed off to factory jobs and all the rest. And I wanted to go fly airplanes for a living. But uh, my original plan was the Air Force Academy, honestly. And what ended up happening was I ended up not even actually applying for the academy because um, I ended up taking, deciding to take the standardized testing at the first available opportunity as early as I could then, which was like first semester of my junior year. I didn't even take it in my, in my uh, I think maybe second semester junior year. Yeah, second semester junior year or something like that. Um, I went on and took the testing. Um, and this, again, predates, you know, all these everywhere you can drive on every corner now where you can go pay and prep for these tests kind of things. I just went in there and took it cold. And um, and I and I did well enough. Um, and so what started happening was I started to get a mailbox full of letters. Um, it was a it was a great timing is sometimes everything in life. And honestly I my life has benefited a bit from that timing. And in the eighties in the States um, there was a lot of good uh, affirmative action going on in the university systems and things like that. And, um, and at the same time, the military was trying to grab anybody with an engineering degree they could grab. Because I think they knew where the service was going. The service was getting really technical. Um, and so, you know, once those scores came back, um, you know, the, the mailbox started to fill with stuff in different schools and where I wanted to go. And what ended up happening was a buddy of mine who was a track athlete had, was getting recruited by VMI. I never heard of the place. I'd grown up in Virginia, never heard of it. Um, but it was a pretty, it was small and uh, it was a private school, it was quite exclusive um, and, you know, vastly, <laughs> vastly, um, you know, white um, upper class, you know, dads went there, grandfathers went there, uncles went there kind of small private in the mountain school um, sort of thing. And uh, and so my buddy was talking about it and I was like, hey, do they have Air Force ROTC? And he was like, yep. And I'm like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll apply there. And I went and talked to a guidance counselor at the high school. We had great guidance counselors back then. And she was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. The school is fabulous. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a really, really good school. Um, and so on and so forth. And they had a scholarship program, what they call a legacy scholarship program, right from my high school. Some grad had gone there that had graduated from Petersburg High School and left a buttload of money in an endowment. And essentially, if you could qualify to get in, you could go. Very nice, nice. Now, why did you choose the Air Force branch of the military services? Um, why did you not choose to fly in the Navy or to join the Marines? I had that offer. Um, once I got into VMI, I got that offer, um, from the Navy guys and I, and I got it through an odd way. Um, in my junior year, I had to go take my flight physical, my first flight physical. I'd never taken one. And what I found out in taking that, no, it wasn't even my junior, it might've been my freshman year I had to take it. My vision wasn't 2020 anymore. It had gone from 2020 to 2025. And, um, what ended up happening was the Air Force didn't want to give me a waiver for pilot training for the, for the I thing. And so I went to the Navy guys and they offered me a pilot slot and, uh, and a waiver for the I thing. And I sat down and thought about it hard. And the truth of it, be, it was pretty simple. I was dating a girl that ended up being my wife, dating her pretty seriously. And I, and for me, the whole plan had always been graduate, flight school, get married, family, you know. I watched I Dream of Jeannie, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. So, 
<laughs> now you know, you're dating yourself. <laughs> and I couldn't see my, you know, I wanted to come home every day, you know, in my flight suit. I, I didn't see myself being on a ship for six and nine month deployment. That's essentially right. what did it. When I talk to the guys and go, are, you know, how long are those guys spending out at sea? And, you know, those are six and nine months, you know, out. I was like, that's out for me. That's that's not right. the life I want to live. Right. And right. and that's that's why. Okay. All right. That uh, that makes sense. I never quite thought of it that way. But yeah, I suppose if you're flying, then you get to go home every night, which is interesting. So now another question a bit in a, on a tangent here. Are there any servicemen or military men, um, past or present, that you would consider to be your inspiration? You consider that point to be your inspiration? And if so, who and why? None. I didn't yeah. know anybody. The only person I knew in the military at the time was an uncle of mine who I didn't know very well um, because he had never lived close enough to me in the time I could remember. And he had been in Vietnam. It had not been a good experience for him, like a lot of guys that were that were enlisted guys in, in Vietnam in the Army. And um, and he was living in Michigan so okay. um, and, and up in Connecticut. And so I never really got to know him that way. And I didn't know anybody else. Nobody else was in the military. It was, it was, it was my thing. It was your thing. Okay. So that you came to, you came to that decision on your own. Um, just another uh, quick deviation. So fast forwarding to today, um, obviously one of the, um, the emphasis I like to make on my, uh, show is I interview, um, uh, black male professionals and want to talk just a little bit about that before we get back into the military service. So, uh, let's talk a bit about what your profession is, um, what's your degree in, and uh, tell us just a little bit about your, your professional um, history. Uh, well, um, it's, all, it's still all coupled to the military, but my, I ended up getting a mechanical engineering degree out of VMI for nothing, for no reason more than I thought it would help to have a technical degree <laughs> to go fly. And also, um, by the time I did get in there and learn a little more, because believe me, <laughs> when you're dealing with the pressures of, of military academy, uh, and the academics, <laughs> um, you, you start questioning your major and a lot of guys change majors. They do. A lot of guys come in. They used to have a saying for that, that went ME for mechanical engineering really meant maybe econ. <laughs> you, you were going to change your major to economics and electrical engineering meant eventually econ. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's how many guys were flipping their majors once they got in. Uh, but I felt very strongly that I wanted to hold on to that engineering degree because um, I just felt it would be a good fallback if if flying didn't work out. You know, you, you didn't get to pilot training, and back then, uh, flight training was like what you saw on Officer and a Gentleman or something like that. It was a washout program. They would bring. Okay. In a buttload more guys than they ever plan to see get through the program and basically the survivors get wings and the others go home and I saw a lot of that you know when I was there of guys that literally ended up down in Sacramento selling cars before our class had even gotten through man so training. were you nervous about that 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 could potentially be your your fate I was nervous for a little while because I had never flown airplanes. I'd never been in an airplane. I'd never flown on a commercial airplane. I, I, wow. And you wanted to be a pilot. You never actually never. flown to like never. Never. vacation the, anywhere. Wow. The first time I even flew on a commercial airplane was I was already graduate. I had graduated from VMI because I went to my summer camp late, uh, what they call your Air Force ROTC camp. And that's where I got my second lieutenant bars pinned on me and everything. And I went late. I went after I graduated and I had to fly to Sacramento and that was the first time I'd even been on a commercial airplane, but it did devouch something that made me nervous. I got air sick on the commercial flight. And you wanted to be a pilot. Wow. And that made me <laughs> now, did it make you think twice? Like, I don't know if this was such a good idea. No, it made me nervous. It just made me feel like, you know, there's a hurdle I'm going to have to deal with, but I'll deal with it when I get there sort of thing. And um, and that's what I did. I dealt with it <laughs> when I when I when I got there. But no, the academics were fine. Um, none of that was none of that was hard for me. You know, um, you know, guys complain about the whole fire hose treatment of, of flight training, malinformation you got to ingest. But 
you know, I'd come from a pressure filled situation. VMI was like that, you know, there was physics, math and chemistry and all the rest. And then God's kicking your ass every day. So, well, I, I, that's what I want to ask you about. That's my next thing. So tell me, tell us a little bit about your experience at VMI. So when you walked in as a freshman, um, you had a certain perception of what you're, what you're up against. And then when you walked out, <laughs> you, want to hear you had, that story? Had, had, had a frame of reference for, okay, now that's what that was really about. I had no idea what I was walking into. Tell us a little bit about that. None. None. You know what I did? I never even went to the school. Here's why. Here's, here's why. This is, how, this, is how, this is how I was. I was so like, I'm going to go. And, and my mother was like, so you're going. Because once she went back to her factory after I got my acceptance letter and got my scholarship, and she started putting word around at work. And believe me, this is, this is back in the 80s. It's still sort of a pecking order for even the jobs in the, in the factories back, back in Petersburg at the time. And she starts telling people, you know, that her son's going to VMI. <laughs> now you're going to go. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was what it was. All the, the, all the white people knew about VMI. They knew of the school. And they're like, what? Your son's going to VMI? Really? You know, kind of, mm -hmm. well, congratulations with this look of skepticism. Yeah, like, you know, you sure you know what you're talking about? <laughs> You know, has he really gotten in there sort of thing? Um, and so, you know, after about a week of that, my mom's like, you're going. <laughs> you have to go now. You're I'm going. no space. <laughs> that's, that's that. You're going and that is that. And so I didn't even, I'm like, well, then why even do the visitation day? Screw it. You know, I'll, I'll yeah. see it when I get there. Right. And that's what I did. Literally, I showed up. <laughs> I show up the first day, dude. Dressed like a player from my from high school, dude. I got a little chain on, with a Playboy bunny head on it. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. I got, was like, did, did you like? Sir, did you get some hot stuff? Remember, remember the creased jeans, my yep. jeans creased, yep. and I got my Stacey Adams on, dog. I'm pimping. <laughs> when I roll up, I I roll up, and man, I ate shit all day for that. <laughs> I mean, those guys never let up. And here's the funnier. My mom had never seen the place either. So she brings me there to leave me, and she doesn't want to leave. <laughs> he's crying. My dad, he's crying now. You're driving away. She, when you ride up, man, all you hear is this roar of noise in the barracks. It's just there's so many guys screaming. It just sounds like a loud roar. And you're like, what the hell is going on in there? And it's, you know, the upper three classes are there just giving it to the rat. So they got you out number three to one that first day. And they're just giving it to you. And my mom can see that going on because the arches are open. You can see right in the barracks. Right. And she can see this going on. And... And this guy standing there with this straight face and all he's standing there at the arch going, you ready? You ready? Are you ready? You know, he's watching you hug your mother and all this stuff. <laughs> and he's trying to walk away, you know. Bye, mama. He pushed her off, <laughs> push her off of you and you walk in there. <laughs> and dude, you better not be crying. You know? <laughs> right, you never live it down. <laughs> you better not be crying. Because believe me, the whole barracks Make will sure know in an hour. They will know. Oh, man. Word spread. Yes. And, but for those who are listening, um, rats, if I recall correctly, I did my research, uh, is how they refer to the um, the trainees coming in. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, the freshman. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. freshman, right. You're a rat until the, until the end of the rat line when you finally get to break out and become a cadet. You know, right. the academy calls them plebes. Everybody has a name for them. Yeah. The MI, you're, the, you're a rat. And, uh, you're a rat. <laughs> yeah, dude, I ate it all day. I think I ended up with the most nicknames in VMI history. Nobody <laughs> you can ask any of my roommates um, the, the stuff that happened to me at VMI. The number of nicknames. And I mean, within an hour, I had a nickname. And <laughs> that playboy for that stupid damn necklace. That <laughs> and you go, rat playboy. Look at the Look at that wig here. What is that? <laughs> My guys are eating you up, right? What is that? <laughs> right. What is that? Oh, 
all day. I mean, dude, I could not wait. By the time I got a chance to change out of my clothes, I literally was tearing them off of my body. <laughs> right. I was so mad right in the about garbage shit about my clothes. <laughs> Get me into whatever everybody else is wearing. No, they right, look, so I can blend in. You can forget about me. <laughs> they just ate me up, man. All the damn time. So that's BMI. So once you got past all that and you and you, you got in, um, at what point did life get to uh, normal? <laughs> what at school? Yeah, we kind of blended in with with the rest of the. Uh, uh, well, rat. So rat life is not meant to be normal because that program is a washout program as well, right? Okay. Um, they bring in more cadets than they plan to graduate, and uh, and so you know that's that. Life didn't really start to feel normal, like more about academics than than insanity, and because you gotta you you earn privileges. The more as you get up higher in class order, you earn more privilege, more freedoms, until. You know, hell, my second semester, my junior year. By then, I knew I had the academics covered, um, and uh, so I was sure I was going to graduate. I wasn't sweating that at all. I had the academics covered, and um, you know, I had a decent level of privileges. And the other cadets treat you like you got it covered because you earn your ring. I'm I'm not wearing it today, and uh, in in that. Um, in that first semester so by the second semester you got your ring and that's when that vmi the guys really consider you one of them okay. you know including including you know the guys that have graduated the alumni is once you earn that ring and that doesn't happen every yeah. year everybody else is, is a washout waiting to happen mimics <laughs> because academics get a lot of guys or just the pressure of being in that pressure cooker um, the restrictions on your freedoms, the rules, the rules are very strict. You can get in trouble. You can get suspended quite easily. Um, the honor court will get you. Uh, and, uh, and so, and it's all male. Right. So, right. you know, I, I mean, I've seen guys give up their dream over, you know, high school girlfriends that go to college and become, you know, freshman dumbasses and, you know, and run off. <laughs> With, with some frat guy and guys lose their shit and, you know, and just drop out. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to fast forward a bit now. <clears throat> At some point you, you graduated and left VMI. Now what happens, what's the transition between uh, leaving VMI as a graduate? Like, you know, first of all, what um, ranking did you, did you acquire when you leave? And then how do you make the leap from there to the air force? Like, what's that transition look like? <laughs> Dude, after VMI, everything else was easy, and it's been that way through life. <laughs> really, <laughs> VMI was wow. The only thing that's ever gotten hard is personal shit, you know. Yeah, marriage, that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, something happened to <laughs> it's part of the VMI. Right. But everything else about life was a piece of cake. And I remember sitting in a class one time when I was a sophomore, still in the ROTC class. And a young lieutenant had come back. He may have been a first lieutenant by then. So that means he's probably been in, been, had been in the Air Force maybe a year and a half, two tops. And he came back to speak to us, was just in the class. And he says, I'm going to tell you something. He said that your worst day in the Air Force will be better than your best day here. And I never forgot that. I remembered that. And he was right. He was right. Um, wow. He was right. And so the transition was really easy. I've been wearing a uniform all my life. So the discipline of the service, all that kind of stuff was easy. You know, um, it, it was a non-issue. Um, matter of fact, some of the later stuff was, was so easy. I got in trouble sometimes with guys telling me like, listen, this shit matters to these guys. They haven't been through what you've been through. So you need to back off, you know, and, yep. and, uh, and just play along kind of stuff. And, okay. uh, but yeah, it was pretty easy. You come out of school and you usually have a training date, like when you have to show up um, for for your training uh, for whatever career field you're going in. For me, it was flight school. And mine was nine months later, actually. I had nine months of, of dead time where I was a ranked officer um, without pay because I wasn't serving, I wasn't serving any duty anywhere. And I just had to kill that time not get in trouble, get a DUI or get physically hurt and disqualified from flying essentially. And, uh, and so I ended up taking an apartment with my cousin 
getting him off his mother's sofa. And <laughs> taking an apartment with my cousin up in Richmond, which is about 30 minutes away from where I'd grown up, and just taking a job, you know, working working in a build a square, a place that predates Home Depot. Right. Uh, as a, like a service desk manager, just holding it down, making my car payments, and hanging out, honestly. I'm waiting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so now let's let's fast forward. Now that you are now in the Air Force, um, um, where were you deployed, and when did you find out what your first mission was going to be? Mission or assignment? Assignment. Um, you don't find out what your first assignment's going to be until uh, until you're pretty far along in flight training. Um, I mean, uh, essentially you're. So there's, there's, there's generic flight training, then that's what they call tracked training, where they figured out whether or not you're going to fly big airplanes or little ones. And then, <clears throat> once you graduate that, that's what they call weapon system training, where you go to train your specific airplane, that one, that you're going to fly versus a training aircraft. Um, and it's in that phase, later in that phase, where you kind of figure out how you rank in class and, and about where you're going to end up. And, and then you start getting closer to figuring out where you're going to be based. And my first debate, my first assignment was Southern California. Um, it's what I'd always wanted to do, <laughs> was live in Southern California. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that had just always been my life's plan. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I took an aircraft um, in a base location that, had, that was stationed in Southern California, and I ended up in March Air Force Base in Riverside County. Is my first assignment. Okay, so you were assigned there now. Um, at this point, this is obviously before any um, anything was going on with Iraq. This is before all the COVID. Oh, yeah. You're just this is, like this is peace. This is peace time. Eighty-seven. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Right. Right. It was the Reagan years. The service was well funded. Um, we were flying, you know, lots of training missions. Um, I was in California, so most of my missions were, if they weren't local, my TDYs, temporary duty assignments, and all this kind of stuff, and long hauls were always across the Pacific. So, I mean, you know, once a month I was in Hawaii or something, or, the, or the, you know, out to the Philippines, or, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was fun. It was good assignments. Right. Good times. And what happened was they disbanded our unit. They decided the, they had a round of closure, and they were doing some base consolidations. And so I ended up out in um, Warner Robins down in middle Georgia here, just south of Macon, uh, and, um, and the sign there. And I went there because a buddy of mine I had met in flight school, a guy you know, named Tom Lacey was there. And he said, why don't you come on out here and, and, and hang with us? And, uh, and so and, I, and that's what I did. And so we went out there. And I liked Warner Robins. It was a good, it was a good assignment. But yeah. Um, and then, you know, when we were there is when all the stuff kicked off. That's when it's stuff happened. Persian Gulf. Um, so now, when were you then deployed to the Persian Gulf? Um, I was deployed to the Persian Gulf. I'm trying to remember were we doing a lot of rotations there before the war. I know we did a lot of rotations after. Some of this stuff starts to go together in your head a bit <laughs> when it's as far removed as, as I am now. But I do know my first big deployment was Desert Shield. And I knew what it was for, obviously, because <laughs> um, Iraq had invaded. Um, and, uh, you know, there was all this hoopla that, you know, this buildup, we're going to go, go to war, we're going to go to war. And that was, I was ready for that. I knew what I had signed up for. You know what I mean? And it's not so much that I signed up for war. I just knew what I was on the hook for. It wasn't always going to be fun and flying on the government dime, right? You know what I mean, yeah. and and all of that. So I I I, I completely accepted that fact, um, and and almost and everybody I knew that flew airplanes did. The guys I saw that that couldn't accept the fact, um, and that ran around crying or whatever. You know, if I heard any instances of that, I did the most whining about that fact. Were guys that were that were for for as far as the Air Force concerned were not combat force guys. They were like the military police guys and stuff like that, you know, which is odd. Yeah, but, because they wouldn't know, see any they wouldn't see any action. They're MPs, you know. But you never know, right? The base gets attacked right. or something like that. Who knows? I don't True. know. Yeah, those guys are <laughs> scared shitless. But the flyers, 
we weren't scared at all, dude. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we had been flying our asses off. We were super, super well trained and we were ready. I mean, I think that's one of the, if there was a single, so the Don made many mistakes, but one of the things he truly underestimated was the American willingness to actually fight. And, um, and what he didn't know was that America was waiting for a fight, you know, mm -hmm. especially the air Corps guys, we were in guys, you know, and all that, you know, we were ready to whoop somebody's ass. Cause honestly, you get tired of having Vietnam over your head, you right. know? Yeah. Right. And that so, was the last major, um, war that, uh, that yeah. occurred before desert storm was Vietnam and that didn't go so well. Um, <clears throat> So now you said you were deployed. Now, where were you deployed to when you finally got deployed to the Middle East? Like, which country? I was in, um, I was in Oman. Oman, okay. Yeah, I was in Oman, right down on the, on the point of, of the Arabian Peninsula, right down there. And what we would do is we take off from there. I mean, literally, we were in a tent city that was right on the runway for a commercial airport. <laughs> I mean, literally on the runway. And, uh, and so, yeah, we would fly out of there, fly up the Gulf, pick up fighters or whatever we were meeting or dragging in that were stationed the bases a little closer, um, pick them up, join up with them, get joined up on them, drag them in uh, to their targets, hover, wait for them to come back because uh, they burn a lot of fuel when they're in attack mode and then hook up to them bring them back uh topped off and then drop them close enough to their base where usually they're they're in range of a good navigation aid where they can just fly straight to their bases and land uh, because they didn't have navigators on board right well let's talk about that for a minute because <clears throat> i know i mentioned a bunch of different um uh air force assets at the top of the show and uh, we didn't really talk about what uh what you know what your role was and what um, equipment you were uh, responsible for. So you want to let's just take a step back and, and talk about that. Okay. What type of aircraft were you on, and what was your role, and what did you know? How, what was your, what did you have to do on that aircraft? I was an, I was the navigator. So you know, for guys that seen movies, you know, I was the backseater guy, and 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 I was in an air refueler. Um, and honestly, the main reason I chose the air refuel over like a B-52 or a bomber was because I wanted to be able to see out the windows. Remember the thing about the motion sickness? Yes. Ah, yeah. that's so, now that makes sense. I didn't know all that. Okay, keep going. Yeah, that was that was that was a big reason I took the the uh, 135 was because up there the navigator sat in the front and I could see out the window versus sitting in the bottom of a B-52 staring at a radar screen screen that's sweeping. Uh, you know, I've been puking my guts out, right? And uh, and so, uh, yeah. So th that that's that was my gig, and then, and then that airplane, you know, just it, it's a very um, um, navigator intensive m aircraft. Once the pilot takes that thing off the ground, and even that is usually that timing is controlled by the, the lead navigator in the formation of the navigator of the plane. And we take off, we get airborne, the navs call everything. You know, we call altitude, we call headings, we call airspeed, we, we run the whole thing, you know, and we spend all our time mapping, radar reading, doing all that sort of stuff, working the timing and, and, uh, and sort of controlling the mission, if you, if, if you will, from the air, in the airplane. In the airplane. It's almost like being the, the quarterback of the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the, and the pilots, you know, they're doing this. And, uh, and so... Uh, and then you get you get joined up, and when air refueling starts, the navigator's still calling everything else, and the boom operator's back there controlling the boom and plugging guys up and, and fueling them up. And so for those who um, <clears throat> are wondering what that is, um, I will include uh, an IBAR link right here at the top um, that will show you exactly what the air tankers did um, and how... Um, how they would refuel uh, these fighter craft while they were in the air. And <clears throat> just to make sure I understand this, 
part of the reason why um, that was one of the important assets um, that was net new, by the way, that did not exist uh, in during the course of, um, of the Vietnam War was because the fighter aircraft, the F-15s, the F-15C, had they would carry so much ordnance, and the ordnance was so heavy, they all they also could not take off <clears throat> off of an aircraft carrier with a full fuel tank. So they would take off with just enough fuel to kind of get up, get into the air, completely filled or um, um, loaded with uh, with ordnance, and then they would. Ha this is why your role was so important. And keep me honest here, that. If you weren't able to connect with them and refuel them to give them a full tank while they were in the air, they, in theory, would have to turn around and go back because they wouldn't have enough fuel to yeah, complete yeah. the mission and turn around and come back. They, they couldn't make it to target, and they certainly couldn't couldn't fly uh, their tactical portion um, without the fuel. So the deal was you load you you load the plane with weaponry because it's paid to carry weaponry. We're paid to carry fuel. Load them up with weaponry. We carry fuel. They get into the air. Once they're in the air, they can carry a lot more weight than they could take off with, essentially, without having to have a super long runway. And you got to remember, takeoff is a complex thing in judgment. Another reason they didn't take off with all that weight is because if they had to abort to take off, they wouldn't be able to stop in the distance of the runway, right? Because what's happening is, you, without getting too complex in flight, they, in the ideal takeoff scenario, you have enough runway to allow you to get to rotate speed, abort, put, get the wheels back down, and stop before the end. That's ideal. Now, as the plane gets heavier, guess what? It eats more of that runway getting to rotate speed. And right. rotate speed is higher. Heavier plane needs more speed to fly. Right. And so that's another reason why they didn't try to take off with all that weight. Gotcha. Okay. And so you would fuel them on the way to the mission, and you'd also fuel them all the way the way back from the mission. Yeah, they would they would come up, um, and what you wanted those guys focused on is what they were going to do on target. You didn't want them worrying about map reading and you know navigating their aircraft to the target and and trying to find their way there. So we would take them in very close, and we got closer and closer and closer as the war wore on, um, and and drop them, uh, and. Uh, and then either, uh, and we drop them very close, sometimes close enough they just would go in on their own. Uh, early stages, AWACS would pick them up and, and direct them, give them vectors in, and then they would, they would take over. And, okay. And now, um, which countries did you visit, and in particular, <clears throat> which countries did you have to fly? Uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be a sortie. That would be considered a sortie for you, I think. Would that be uh, Every a sortie? Every considered a sortie. <laughs> Okay, every, okay. Every place some are combat, some are training, but they're all considered sorties. Which countries did you um, um, cross their borders? Kuwait, uh, Iraq, not Iran. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, a lot of, you know, Saudi Arabia, um, obviously Oman, um, you know, all of those friendly uh, uh, countries. Um, we we flew over their airspace, uh, okay. and then you know post the war, you know as part of the pullout, we ended up in Cairo. Ended up in Cairo for a month, uh, flying out of there. Uh, now, uh, how many? Do you know how many missions you flew? Do you have an idea of how many missions you had to fly? I know I the the, the Desert Shield missions. I I don't know off the top of my head. The combat missions I do know. We flew. Sixty-seven combat missions. Um, Mike and I did together. Um, matter of fact, we flew so much that there's there's only a certain number of flights that they'll allow you to fly in a certain time period. Then you have to go on what they call an extended crew s, and then you can fly some more. And we were flying out that window. You know what I mean? We were we were exceeding that. Because they wavered it for for the war, there was a there's a peace time limit. Then there was a war time limit. They right. wavered and extended it. And I mean, for a while we were flying. I don't know. It felt like like every ten, every nine hours or so, we were back in the air. Wow. So we were turning a lot of flights, man. A lot of airplanes. And, right. You know, and I remember, you know, going over there. I had a nine millimeter in my backpack that was my own. 
Um, <laughs> Eat the big one. Two weapons to us, but they allowed us to take them. So a lot of guys had their own guns, man. So dudes had 357s. I had a nine mil. You know, you took your own stuff, your own hardware. <laughs> right. And um, and I was we went over there, and uh, and I remember, you know, it's not like we got some early clue that the war was going to start tomorrow. You know, you all knew that was not how it was, um, because I was ordered for Desert Shield. We rotated back because a plane needed to come back and was lucky to draw. We got to fly that plane back. Spent a few weeks at home and then got sent back. I remember I got into a big ass argument with this colonel about that. Got sent back. Um, and then um, I just remember one night I was out, you know, I don't know, probably about 10 o'clock. Because it was so hot in the day, you weren't out in the day. So I was just out walking around the camp or something. I don't know why the hell it was outside. It was just, you know, the air was dry and it was nighttime. And I could hear all these engines starting at the same time. And I'm like, it's on. That's it. It's on. It's That's going down. Knew. Wow. Yeah, it's going down. And uh, and so I went I went to bed because I knew I was going to be flying soon. And the first, the first one, you know, you're a little nervous. You're tense. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. You know, I don't know what's going to go down. Right. But I'm telling you, man, by the end of that first flight, I remember thinking, this is over. This is over. I don't know what these guys are thinking. This is over. And the reason I said that is because we had so many planes in the air. You know, we had so many planes in the air. I'm like, there's no way for, for an enemy force to survive as many planes as we have in the air. Right. There's just no way. I think the, the, uh, the battle uh, with Iraq um, lasted, I think it was like a month, right? After a month, it was uh, not the whole battle, but basically uh, the U.S. had established air superiority within this course of a month. Is that a fair statement? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. even less than that, I would say. Even less than that. Yeah, even, even yeah. less than that. I mean, I mean, I think by a month, they couldn't get a plane in the air. You know, air superiority yeah. was established in the first night. The first wow. Now, now what's, what's Desert Shield? What, what's the difference between Desert Shield and Desert Storm? Um, Desert Shield was when we got there at, to stop the aggression because we figure you let them take Kuwait, the next thing you know, they're going to come into Saudi Arabia, okay, um, and, and try to take oil fields and take land there. And so that was, that was the shield part of it. So let's get into some, uh, what are some of your most prominent memories of Desert Storm? I know you told me a story once about um, uh, when you would fly, um, <clears throat> you're flying a mission, and uh, you were getting ready to, you, I guess you're, you're navigating the, um, the F-15s uh, to their target, and sometimes you'd run into cloud cover. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, that story, or those stories. Well, that year was like a particularly rainy year for that part of the world. I mean, it was really rainy. Weather was atrocious. I mean, it was cloudy all the time. I mean, just it was just a lot of weather. Um, and uh, and then you know you had you know they, they they had the oil fill fires and stuff like that. But that oil smoke is a very heavy smoke. It stays really close to the ground. So that wasn't too much of a hassle for us in the sky. But the cloud cover was was horrible. Um, it was a lot of weather, and. What ends up happening is um, air refueling is, is usually very, very dependent on visual acquisition of the target, the fighter guy seeing us. Um, so usually the first part of it's obviously based on timing. Let's say it's a clear day. It's timing based. We hit a point at a certain time. They hit a point at a certain time. We set the plane in a pattern. And if I time that pattern right, they show up literally on time and roll in behind us. That's how precise the timing is. If they hit their target on time, I navigate our airplane to hit that target just ahead of them. You know, and they roll in like a mile in trail. And that's when the nav light nailed it. Right. Wow. Um, but what ended up happening was the weather was so bad that even at that distance, they couldn't see us. <laughs> they wouldn't see the plane. They could never they, they could paint you on the radar. But we couldn't they couldn't use their radar because they were loaded with weaponry and their radars that is also their targeting radar so you know they couldn't light us up with a targeting radar um 
because there was an accident, they blows out a damn sky. So they were really dependent on visual. And so what we were doing was timing these rendezvous to be like right on top of them. And so, you know, and what they do is we turn on our lights and they come up, come up, come up so they can see the lights in the cloud and then bang, there's a big ass airplane right there. Wow. But what happens is, is sometimes we, the you know, the weather would get like bad too, like you can't see 30 yards. And what's happening is when the weather's clear, they're sitting out there off the wing, you know, and behind you, because there's usually like six of them and they're just all around you. And you're like, I wish somebody would come try to get some of this. <laughs> but as the weather gets bad, they start pulling in, pulling in, pulling in, because they don't want to lose visual on you, because it'll, right. it'll blow the mission. It'll take them forever to rejoin. And so, and sometimes you you'd come out of those clouds, or the clouds are thin a little bit, and you look, and you you can see the pilot, man. Dude's right there. He's like on top of the wing. Gee whiz! He's right on top of you. And uh, that takes a precision flying. The guys were good, man. The guys were good and we weren't the only ones that were good you know when you read off the list before you forgot a lot of countries participated in that you know the swiss guys the belgian dudes were crazy they were awesome you know the canadian guys were there a few canadian f-18s um they were there. uh yep every you know the british guys were, were, were there in force you know um because everybody had a lot of modern weaponry that honestly they were looking for somebody to use it on. Right, they were looking you know? to use it. Now, I know the F-18s, I, I don't know a whole lot about them, but I think they're older equipment relative to the F-15s. Is that a fair statement? No, 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 no. They're about the same age. F-15 might be a little older. Then there's a Strike Eagle variant that came along later of the F-15. Uh, and then F-16 is in there, and there were different variants of that. Um, there, there, was, there was some serious weaponry. On, wow. yeah, on, on, yeah. There, I mean, I, I remember seeing the, the the footage, and again, I as I mentioned before in the uh, in, in the low bar, I'll include clips for people to sort of see um, some of the footage for those who hadn't seen it or don't recall it. But um, it is absolutely fascinating. Um, the air power was just amazing. Now, what was the most dangerous aspect of your mission? Um, obviously, if I'm flying a fighter jet and I have a port, uh, a fraction of a uh, tank of fuel, um, you know, there's certain incentives if I'm the enemy to try to keep them from getting to me. So what was the most dangerous part of the mission? Uh, they had no control of that. They, they had no control of that. The, the, the enemy had no control of that. They, they had, they offered no resistance to anything we were doing in the air. And about the only time we ran into any resistance is when the guys were actually making their bombing runs and attack runs. Um, because, um, because, because they could use ground weaponry, you know, any aircraft stuff and, and because, but their radars were knocked out and the few radar tracking systems that they had, they were afraid to turn on because, you know, the strike Eagle guys and the other guys, you know, and, and the stealth guys were, were blowing them up, blowing them right out of the sky. Anytime they tried to turn anything electronic on, the guys were blowing it up. So they were essentially shooting blind, which is why you see the sky so filled with, and, and honestly, you know, the few planes that did get hit, it was blind luck. You know, there was just so much crap in the air eventually. And we had so many planes in the, in the air. Eventually something was going to hit something. Right. Someone's going to hit something. So you get a, you get the occasional down plane, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a question here for you. Um, the question is, uh, uh, if you can talk a little bit about um, your training to fly blackbirds. Oh, yeah, that was much later in my career. Um, so what ended up happening was after Desert Storm, after the war, it's back to peacetime and, and normal sort of flying except we're going over to the Middle East all the time now. Um, and uh, I took a. I ended up taking a later assignment. I took another assignment. It was time to take another assignment, and I ended up getting into flight tests. I got selected to be part of a flight test organization out at Edwards Air Force Base, which is you know the same base with you know Jaeger and all the other right stuff. Things took place. It's the exact same place, uh, and I ended up out there. Um, great assignment. It was a really good family assignment because. They lived at the base. You lived at the base. You were home every day. It was like business was flying. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, 
And what ended up happening was is that uh, the SR-71s had gotten, the, they had been deactivated. You know, administration has come in, the Air Force guys really want to spend their money in satellite technology and not manned surveillance technology. And, and also drones and stuff like that. So that's our program had gotten shut down. But um, while I was out at Edwards, somebody brought it back, some congressman, somebody decided that they wanted to bring that program back. And when they brought it back, they opened it up at Edwards. They brought them to Edwards. And um, what happened was is that when they brought it back, the situation was kind of contentious was actually quite contentious um, and what um, the, the, the unit was limited to essentially was finding the crew members that they needed at Edwards because the Air Force was not going to pay the PCS or move new guys out there for them. So they were gonna have to, they were they were going to shop for Edwards and Basically low, low budget. They didn't want to spend money to move resources. That's around. right. That's right. And yeah. um, I ended up meeting one of the guys through motorcycles. There's so so many things that happened in my life through motorcycles. I ended up meeting one of the one of the air crew guys, a lieutenant colonel, um, through motorcycles, common love of bikes. And and that's how that whole SR seventy one thing started. And the long and the short of it was they needed backseat guys. They were they were recruiting and uh, they needed one more crew. And um, I, you know, I got to fly the simulator and, and do some stuff like that. But essentially, I pulled out of it because in the end, it ended up being so contentious. They said that, you know, I remember finally, you know, getting a briefing from the squadron commander, the colonel. He says, listen, he says, you know, all the guys like you, the interview process has gone well and all the rest. And he says, but I got to be honest with you. He says, here's what's likely going to happen. It takes a year to train to fly this airplane. And what is likely going to happen is that by the time that year is up, our appropriation is going to end and they're going to shut this program down. And the first time you fly a plane, you're going to fly to the boneyard. And um, and that's essentially what happened. So, you know, given the fact that two things were at play at the time, uh, my wife wanted out of that desert. I told her we we're only going to be there three years and was already gone on like six or something at the time. Oh. <laughs> And uh, and she wasn't all that happy about me thinking about taking another job there that meant staying. And that, uh, but she did concede. I was like, come on, it's SR-71. You got to cut me some slack. Uh, but once he told me that, I just didn't see the, the, point. the cost of it being worth it. And yeah. so I, I pulled out of it. And, uh, and Okay. And another question here. This is um, a little bit of a, a, a variation. So... What was it like to serve as an African American in the U.S. military? In your opinion, was your treatment as an officer any different than it was for for white officers, or was it you're an officer? It's all that matters. Um, that's the way it seemed to me, and I don't remember having 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 had any side conversations with other black flyers that said anything any different, or they felt anything different about the experience. Um, yeah, I remember most of those guys went on. Uh, fly UPS FedEx and you know those are white pilots that had already retired before them that got them got their resumes in and got them the, their those jobs so no I don't remember it being any different um, at all honestly no no, no different yeah. at all now, I'd, I'd heard the same I remember reading the book uh, my American journey by um, uh, Colin Powell mm -hmm. retired journal Colin Powell and he had basically different said the same thing it, it's What's that? I said, but he, he was a different time for me, right? Yeah, yeah, he was. But even in his time, he was saying that um, uh, I think that's when the beginning of the um, integration of the military were to the point where it, it did make a difference whether you're black or white, as long as you had a certain, uh, you know, a certain um, work ethic, as long as you had the proper uh, the, the credentials, yeah. uh, your job was your job, and that's all that mattered. Nobody gave a no, crap, crap, you know. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, I, I never sensed that. There, I never had a problem. Um, when did you decide to leave the military and join civilian life, and and why? Uh, honestly, I joined the military, and um, to join, I left the military to join NASA. Um, you know, not to not to come here, but to but to join NASA. 
uh, I had an offer to stay in the military and keep doing what I was doing. Um, or, um, and an offer to go join NASA. Uh, and I took the NASA offer and that was a civilian job. Right. Cause NASA is not part of the military branch. Right. Right. And that was a civilian job. And so when I decided that, that that's why it, that that's essentially why I did it was to join NASA. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, now, how were you received as a veteran when you returned stateside? How has and how has the service impacted your professional life? Um, that's that's like two or three questions in one. Um, when I came back from the Gulf War, um, it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, you know, kind of reception and you know brought tears to my eyes. Literally, it was it was amazing. Um, you know that that was amazing reception and the energy was super duper positive the the whole time i mean you couldn't buy a drink you couldn't do anything you know after that um because that whole stigma had been shaken off of america you know what i mean vietnam right i i can say that professionally as a civilian i'm talking civilian civilian not nasa yeah. um civilian civilian um maybe Eight years ago, there seemed to be a little bit of a backlash um, in the professional sector against military guys because really, yes, 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 because military guys that w were starting to be viewed as being too direct and and people took these naive, simple notions. But you got to remember, there was a generational change in the workforce, right? Yeah, and. Yeah. Uh, I remember one guy actually stood up in a room one time. He wasn't talking to me. He was talking to another military guy, and this guy was saying something. He was in a big group of people, and how he managed something. And the guy stood up and said, "Well, you know, this is the military, and you can't just give orders to and, and, and to people and get things done." I mean, it was it was a, such a nonsensical remark. You know, a lot of people in the room looked like, what the? but but that about? was a, it. Got to be a sentiment of that for a while. To where, and I remember a buddy of mine saying that he felt that he was struggling a bit um, to get placed because of his military background. That people were seeming to be looking for what they felt were were more new age style leaders, more collaborative, more, you know, kumbaya. Let's hold hands yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. You know, or whatever to please this new kind of workforce. You know that wanted more expression and more um, feeling feeling and, 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 and uh, self-actualization in their work uh, or something. And there was, there was a little bit of a, of, a, of a backlash, honestly, professionally. And did you find that was challenging for you? Because obviously you oh, yeah, spent with all your life up to that point in a very hierarchical structure and people understood what the roles were. Um, you did not. Um, if your senior officer gave you a uh, an order, uh, you there was no question about whether you would do it. Um, There's no asking questions about why the order. You would just do it. And did you find that transition to civilian life where people had to be convinced sometimes, or would take your uh, direct order, for lack of terminology, a better terminology, as a suggestion? Did you find that frustrating? No, not 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 because I expect to say a statement to people and they snap and pivot and walk out. The I find that today um, there's a there's a troubling movement to a what I call a lack of professionalism, um, and what I mean by that, people, I see I I see so many people that can't seem to separate their personal life, their personal issues, their personal belief, their personal desires for self-satisfaction and how they feel about things from work. They bring all of these feelings to work. Um, and that's a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy going, being absorbed in the workplace today dealing with feelings um, yes. and I don't have a better way to, 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 to say it. And, and, 
and people will um, will allow their work and the company to be affected. I, I find too easily, even over personal feelings or how they feel about somebody, even in the office. And I'm like, it's it's irrelevant. Get the job done. It's I mean, I I think it goes back to your earlier statement. I think part of that is really a generational shift because. Um, I think you are the tail end of the baby boomers, and I'm at the beginning of the Generation X. So there are a lot of similarities between between the two of us. But then there's this fairly significant deviation or break once you get to the next generation, which are the millennials. Um, and uh, I think you're in my generation. If someone says, "Okay, this is your job. This is job function. I need you to do this. I need you to do by this date. Let me know if you have any, you need any resources. Go make it happen. We're good to go." And mm -hmm. My experience at the last, um, my experience now, because I've worked with um, in a company which has a high um, percentage of millennials, I mean, straight out of school, um, and that is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, relationship building and, and collaboration, let's, and group think, and, you know, while there are some instances where group think I think is necessary, I think there is an overabundance of group think, and yeah. there's a lack of, I've been given the responsibility to do this. I will take this and get it done. I'm not going to sit there and wait for somebody to hold my hand and give me the tools and give me the training. Look, there's YouTube. You can learn stuff on. Uh, on you know, you can you can find the way to, to to pull the resources together you need to do your stuff. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think there's a a, a lack of self sufficiency uh, with the next generation. And I can imagine if you come from a a background where you had to be self sufficient to survive. And that was your core part of your, your training. Dealing with a group that requires constant, you know, um, instruction and constant handholding and constant direction is can be frustrating because it slows down progress because you now got to hold this person's hand to get this job done. Is that a is that a fair analysis? Um, is there's a tendency to take work too personally? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Personally. <laughs> uh, when it doesn't need to be taken so personally, uh, okay, and 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 that's that's really it. Um, work, work has it's 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 almost like another social setting, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. uh, so much energy is going into personally how you think you're viewed and how you feel and. How someone said something to you, and it's, it's did it hurt your feelings? Did you get enough likes on your your Yammer page or, or well, whatever? You know, it's tough to transition from a life where you've been raised where everybody is equal and everybody won and everybody got a trophy to an employment life that says we're not equal, and you know I'm I'm better than you or I've worked harder than you. I'm certainly more valued to this company than you. So I'm here and you're here. And yeah, people that, that's hard for some people to that swallow. Transition um, yeah. mightily. We're I think we're seeing that the effect of that on our economy today is that we are struggling with that. And you're seeing it in a generation of people that for as young as they are, as much energy as I can remember having in my twenties fighting various stages of depression and issues with self-actualization and all these other things because somehow they thought that you know that it was all, the all they had at home was going to transfer to yeah. adult life and in the workforce and you were going to be viewed as such a valuable entity and it's like you're not a number <laughs> if you want to know i mean you know we're, we're suffering from a place or a time where we're giving away work to people that are honestly seemingly more willing to focus on the work and and work harder it to the point of shipping it off to india if, yep that's right people not, who, who have to work all the other caregiving that needs to be done here exactly um, so now given your military experience which aspects of your vmi training and actual field experience would you say have served you best as a civilian it gives you perspective. Do you know what I mean? Yep. That is that is the thing. It gives you perspective. And maybe that's the thing I have 
that a lot of people don't have is perspective. This is why every little thing doesn't phase me or doesn't upset me or knock me out of balance or, you know, make me feel down or, 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 or devalued or, or something like that. It gives me perspective on what a bad day is, on what a shit situation is, on, on a lot of things. As a USAF veteran, what, in your opinion, is the best way that we can honor our veterans who serve now and who have served in the past? What's the best way, in your mind as a veteran, that we can honor um, the service that, uh, that you have given? Honestly, others? I think as a nation, the, the, it's, it's come around. And uh, I think as terrorism came back into the forefront, um, in, in the 2000s and the fact that, you know what, we now have a persistent enemy that somebody needs to go fight or deal with. Um, I, I think the country does is doing a really good job. And, and I'm not talking about government and stuff politicians get up and try to say because it, it seems like the right thing to say. I'm talking about the average guy on the street, you know, who bumps up to me or, or sees an Air Force plate on my truck and just says something to me you know um that's that's it you know that's that's enough nobody else owes me any more than that you know what i mean right. yeah uh -huh. mm -hmm. and that, that's it and you know hopefully they do a good job and open more va hospitals and take care of guys and and, and that's a, that's about it you know yeah yep and i i think that one of the things that uh that really needs attention and we've been talking about it but not much has been done about it is looking after the veterans who come back who need help when they get back and not just those who have the visible um uh, the visible um disabilities if you will but those with the invisible disabilities i i, I think that um i know that a, a large percentage of the homeless um are people who are veterans who've come back and yeah. for whatever reason they just they're not getting the support that they need now um is there anything that you'd like to promote here before we wrap up is is a is a couple of things um the first one is is that i know it's sad and it's and it's definitely cliche but it, it is still true um you can literally become anything you're willing to work hard enough to become um you know like you asked me early on i didn't have anybody i wasn't I wasn't preordained or had some pre-made path of me to what what I did. I just decided I wanted to do it. I was fortunate enough to have parents to said, "Hey, if you want to do it, do it." And and I studied hard and and I got it done. But I was certainly in scenarios where, because I went to went to school with guys who did see the world that way, that there are people out there who are always going to try to not let you have what you have because of their prejudices and whatever. And you know. My thing was, and, and it's my thing today, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it. You know, if it exists, somebody's got to bring it into my face and make it clear to me that's how they feel about me. Because otherwise, you know, if I didn't get it, it's because, you know, they had a better choice or, 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 or whatever. You know, I didn't, I didn't interview well. I, I, didn't, I didn't do something well. I, I won't believe it's otherwise because if you slide into that, you know, you're done. You will defeat yourself um, because it's just too easy to believe that you can overcome that sort of thing. So you might as well chill and take another path. Um, so that's my thing. And it's, and, and it's certainly a lot of nonsense has flared up today that can lead you to believe you need to be suspecting everybody you meet. And um, but but don't let people show you who they are. Then deal with it from there. Agreed. Agreed. Um, because you end up then becoming your own biggest obstacle to progress. Yep. Okay. Um, before I wrap up, personally and on behalf of my viewers on this U.S. Memorial Day, I'd like to thank the following people who've served and who I've had the honor of meeting. Uh, you mentioned one earlier, this Tom Lacey, uh, Jeremy Ryman, Tim Frierson, Michael Pierce, who I believe is watching, Mike Reidenbach, and of course, my friend Daryl Winfield. Uh, if you enjoyed the show and want to see more, join our public Facebook group called The Man Cave by Gentlemen United. All of our shows, tons of additional content and invitations to future shows are posted there. You can add to the conversation and suggest future discussion topics you'd like to see us tackle. 
please like, comment, share, and subscribe by clicking on the general icon right here. If you enjoyed the show and want to see more, click here. Thanks again for joining Gentlemen United in the Man Cave. Enjoyed the show? Like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for joining us in the Man Cave.